Welcome to uh, the next session of uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, this is the second panel where, we'll, where we will look at the, yeah. some of the things that we discussed in the, uh, in the other panels. You know, what is actually the demand for democracy and rule of law in the Western Balkans? So what are the civil society, how are they engaging? And what, how, what does that mean for the EU enlargement process? So I'll pass on the word to our moderator, which is uh, Vetran Djicic, and um, look forward to, to hearing what is uh, going on in the region at, uh, in terms of demand for democracy. So thank you so much for the uh, brief introduction and thank you uh, for organizing the, the event. It's a particular pleasure. And it's a pleasure now to be connected to Denmark and to Tetovo in North Macedonia, in, uh, to Belgrade, to uh, Montenegro. Uh, what we uh, sometimes struggle to achieve uh, when we have to meet physically, uh, we now achieve uh, easily per Zoom, even though, you know, there is some skepticism about Zoom, but let's uh, move towards the, the panel and uh, the, the second topic, which is the demand for democracy. Uh, as the last panel concluded uh, uh, that the rule of law is a question of democracy, uh, we have to argue that Europeanization or the European integration is not the goal per se for itself. It's also about democracy, it's about good governance, it's about transparency, it's about accountability. Uh, it's about everything what citizens uh, in a free democratic society need. Uh, what we face uh, in the region, uh, unfortunately, is a lot of state capture that uh, has been mentioned in the, in the, in the panel before. Uh, and uh, sometimes we get the feeling that democracy is in a way captured, stolen, that we have political elites pretending to be democratic, selling the democraticness to the West uh, and trying basically to misuse or undermine the notion of democracy by pretending to be uh, Democrats, faking democracy in one way. Uh, and when we look into the opinion surveys, we see that citizens are also a bit confused. So they do believe that democracy is the best possible form of governance. But at the same time, they also partly believe that only strong men uh, can deliver, which is a contradiction. However, what all citizens in the region uh, share, and we will discuss it today, is basically the fact that we all face same problems. And we will in in a minute, hear about air pollution. We will uh, uh, hear about the struggle for clean cities, for public spaces. Uh, we will uh, hear about the struggle uh, to keep the cities free from uh, ne nepotism, for corruption, uh, uh, fighting for health systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, as the starter at the beginning, I would argue that there is a huge bottom-up demand for democracy, for good governance. Uh, in the region. And I will also say uh, and argue basically that there are many initiatives, civic movements, local initiatives, people engaged in protests uh, uh, on the streets, uh, in local communities that are fighting for real uh, democratic society and for good governance. Uh, let me uh, move to the panel, which I believe is, is, is very much uh, uh, suited to answer all those questions about the popular demand for democracy. We have a number of activists. Uh, let me first go, uh, let's choose Tetovo, uh, North Macedonia. We have, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Arianit Kshaferi uh, from Echo Guerrilla, uh, which uh, is based in Tetovo in North Macedonia. Uh, is a kind of a watchdog, watchdog organization uh, with one major goal to stop air pollution uh, uh, in uh, in the city of Tetra in North Macedonia, but also in the wider region. So, Arianit, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, we jump from Tetovo to Belgrade. In Belgrade, we have Dobrica Veselinovic, from uh, an activist uh, from Don't Let Belgrade Down or Drown, uh, a big 
uh, initiative formed in 2015, uh, protesting against the destruction of the urban space in Belgrade, against the infamous waterfront development, Belgrade waterfront, uh, that the president of, of, of Serbia likes uh, so much. Uh, and uh, in the last few years, uh, don't, act, don't let Belgrade down, uh, drown, uh, moved and transformed into a political movement uh, and uh, had a kind of a process of, 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 of transforming into a political party, which is something that also happened in, uh, in a way in Montenegro. I, we moved to uh, Luka Rakčević, who is an activist. Uh, from the United Reform Action, uh, which started as a civic movement, which is a social liberal progressive, uh, so green uh, party uh, movement, uh, which succeeded. It has ecological roots, uh, the same way like Eco Guerrilla or also Don't Let Belgrade Drown. Uh, and uh, it succeeded in the last elections. Uh, uh, so uh, you also went, Luca, through this transformation. Uh, and enter the political arena. So we are very keen uh, to hear what you can change. And last but not least, Jelena Vasiljevic joining us from the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Uh, she is a, a thinker, a theorist of social and democratic engagement bottom up, uh, uh, was engaged in several studies uh, looking into potentials of civic movement and civic engagement in the uh, Western Balkans. Uh, and uh, she is also, at least uh, in her free time, uh, uh, that she probably does, doesn't have a lot, uh, also activist or taking part in the structures of Nedavimo Belgrade, don't let Belgrade uh, drown. Uh, so much for the introduction. Uh, let's uh, now uh, move to, to, to the panel. I would like to ask Arianit uh, uh, first. So Arianit, when you look uh, back at, at, at your fight uh, in the last several years, uh, and when you look back at uh, how basically your movement and your uh, guerrilla movement uh, experienced a kind of a growth uh, in, in this period. Uh, what would you say, uh, uh, how uh, important it is uh, to be active in, on the local level, uh, to stand up for fundamental uh, <laughs> problems and rights uh, uh, of, the, of the citizens in small communities or in smaller communities? And what does it, uh, Tell us uh, uh, about a potential change on a broader state level. Well, uh, Vedran, thank you very much for your introduction. It is it is really nice to see you all without masks. Uh, we we've started doing offline events in the, in the country, but we still have to wear the masks now. It's this is different. Although we're online, it's it's really nice to see people's faces. Um, um, as you said, um, we we are active in the Tetovo region, mainly in in, uh, in Polog region, Tetovo and Gostivar, two cities in the uh, north uh, western part of the country of North Macedonia. And I would say it is of a paramount importance to be active in communities like ours, especially since uh, Tetovo has uh, has seen some of the most severe air pollution in the recent years. Um, we started the whole uh, activity back in, in, in 2013, by the end of November, so it will be seven years ago. Um, we started to address this, uh, this, this very sad state of affairs, uh, and uh, because we uh, realized that uh, not much was being done, and I would, I would go on uh, a step further and say nothing was being done uh, to address the issue. Um, we had to uh, do it because, um, to be honest, there's a bunch of, a lot of, many thousands of uh, environmental organizations in the country, uh, but somehow they were um, in a very deep hibernation, perhaps, or didn't care much about the problem. They were very uh, um, donor-oriented, grant-focused. So uh, a group of uh, activists, um, concerned citizens, so to say, uh, came together and we decided that we should uh, we should do something about the air pollution. Um, of course, it was it was very difficult to begin with because we didn't have enough uh, knowledge, we didn't have enough uh, support of the citizens, uh, we didn't have any communication with the uh, authorities, whether in local or central level. Uh, but uh, our growth uh, with with uh, very uh, 
I would say, consistent work, uh, hard work, uh, very aggressive campaigning. Um, uh, our growth happened and then we became a factor. Um, we became a factor, so to say, because now we are being uh, consulted about uh, many decisions and laws that are being uh, uh, taken and made in the country. Uh, and um, and uh, we were like uh, in, uh, in December last year, uh, we were also invited to seat in, uh, in the National Security Council, uh, where we discussed the, um, the environmental issues. Uh, we convinced the president to acknowledge the, uh, the air pollution as a threat to national security, which it is. Um, so um, it's, it hasn't been easy, of course, uh, as my fellow activists from, from other countries, from Belgrade and, and, and Podgorica, I guess, uh, if, I heard, uh, if I heard you right, uh, and, and other activists in the region will tell you, uh, it hasn't been easy since uh, there is a, a high level of corruption and uh, and the um, culture of impunity is is very much present in our countries. So we had to uh, fight uh, huge corporations, and uh, we had to fight uh, their criminal ties with politics in the country uh, in order to uh, to uh, fight for the uh, clean air in our city. Uh, all in all, uh, with, with very much hard work and consistent, uh, consistency, uh, we managed to, uh, to pressure the government uh, to decide on closing down a factory which was the, recognized as the main polluter of the region. It was a first generation uh, metal industry uh, factory which polluted the city of Tetovo by a lot. And uh, ever since they closed, the city of Tetovo has seen a significant uh, uh, drop in air pollution by a significant 60%, uh, which is still not good. Uh, we, we still can't say we have clean air, but we can say we have 60% less polluted air. Um, so um, once again, uh, it, it, it hasn't been easy, but uh, no one thought it would be. Uh, we, we started this whole operation back in 2013 uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, with a lot of uh, um, hope uh, that uh, the people and the country and the authorities will, will stand by us and will do what's right. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't that way, especially with the authorities, because a lot of uh, personal interests were being uh, uh, touched by our activities. Uh, a lot of politicians, as I said earlier, had uh, ties with the business community, with the uh, with the uh, with the owners of that factory. Uh, so um, it, it was ups and downs. But uh, as a political pressure group, Eco Guerrilla had to do what we had to do, and uh, eventually we're happy that uh, we managed to to force the government uh, do some changes. Uh, the most recent change is uh, a huge increase on fines uh, in, in air pollution because, believe it or not, uh, in the whole country uh, with, a, with a court verdict, there has been only one decision to punish a company and it was a supermarket in a city in the most southern part of the country. So they just wrote up a supermarket for polluting the air uh, in a country where uh, factories like Yugochrom or Jelezara in Skopje, Max Steel and so on and so forth are polluting and, and, and putting the lives of the hundreds of thousands at risk. Adiani, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, you started your fight when um, Macedonia was the uh, par excellence example of the captured state in times of former Prime Minister uh, Gruevski when uh, authoritarian tendencies were basically exploding and, and the rule of law was misused uh, to operate, uh, let's say, a criminal regime to a certain extent. And, and it seems to be, a, to a certain extent, a, a success story that you went uh, through. When we now move to, to uh, Belgrade and to Serbia, and I would like to ask Dobrica Veselinovic from Nedavimo Belgrade, a similar question. I mean, Serbia today, uh, is probably uh, as captured and as authoritarian uh, Macedonia as back in the time of Gruevski. Uh, and Nedavimo Beograd, uh, when you started uh, and you are fighting uh, still, 
uh, you manage to to make the movement bigger. You manage to attract many citizens to join you. Uh, but the question will be uh, for you, first of all, uh, what type of obstacles uh, and are you facing? What's your opponent uh, putting on you? And secondly, now that you have a second part of a question, now that you have uh, uh, in a way transformed into a political movement and you have entered the political arena, uh, what are the prospects uh, for really giving the citizens the voice, uh, a democratic voice uh, in a institutional arena that is very much captured and controlled by the by the governing structures. So, Dobritz, uh, uh, the Zoom is yours. Thank you, I hope the, the colony is working in the Just, just in order not to uh, use, uh, lose too much time, uh, you try to check the, 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 and we uh, move, uh, uh, to Yelena Vasiljevic, uh, uh, she is just around the corner in Belgrade too, and she is also, uh, as I said, active uh, in Davimo, Belgrade. So Yelena, uh, basically the same question that I just posed uh, uh, to, uh, to to Dobritsa, but also a kind of a question uh, uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, how fundamental is this kind of a bottom-up pressure and citizens' engagement for democracy uh, in general uh, and in the Western Balkans? Thank you, Vedran. Thank you all for this opportunity. Um, let me just also state that my internet connection was very bad uh, during the first panel. So if I, if I, um, if I disappear, I will just take a minute or two to connect via my phone. But let's hope that will not happen. It's fine now. Um, yeah. Well, when we talk about uh, demands for democracy coming from the level of the citizens. So if we want to take the perspective of, of citizens and how they uh, articulate and whether they articulate this demand, I think we have to say that we have a rather confusing situation in all of the region. It's not that, I mean, you can, there are many protests going on and people are clearly frustrated and dissatisfied with the situation and with the state of their democracies. But we cannot really safely say that uh, we are witnessing a major upsurge of uh, citizens' demands for democracy articulated in such a way. First of all, let me start with some of the studies we've conducted uh, here in Serbia, though, but uh, at least some of the, some of the conclusion, uh, conclusions and, and to some extent could be extrapolated to the other countries of the Western Balkans, that uh, citizens of Serbia feel mostly uh, and in greater greatest part uh, completely uh, disenchanted with politics and uh, disappointed in politics and politicians and not only uh, in the ruling uh, regime and not only uh, the, the, the political uh, party party leaders that are uh, uh, that are uh, ruling but also politicians in general and the political position they're also they feel betrayed so these are the words they feel betrayed and mistrustful in politics in institutions they also feel betrayed by their own institutions and also uh, betrayed by the EU and some other uh, foreign actors and players. Uh, and they don't feel ready and willing to take part in major political processes, protests and activities because they, they do feel frustrated, but they also feel disenchanted. Also to this, we have to add the demographic picture uh, and most of these countries, with the exception of Kosovo, are rather old. Serbia is again leading uh, in this respect in the region. So it's a very old country and with a demographic trend of uh, immigration. So a lot of young, young people are leaving the country every year. So you have an old population uh, which is remembering, which has been living for the past 30 or more years uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in sort of a uh, very uh, a bad situation. I mean, th those are people who remember wars, ethnic conflicts, uh, severe economic insecurity, hyperinflation, autocratic regimes, of course. So we cannot really expect that there to find enthusiasm, enthusiasm for, for the struggle and uh, for um, clear articulations of some democratic demands. Yet still, I mean, we do have protests and movements, and we have very different 
situations and very different instances of this uh, dissatisfaction and articulation. I mean, different different articulations of these demands. So throughout the region, we've had waves of protests that are sometimes difficult to uh, to understand or to put under a single or to put under a clear framework. We had from in 2014 protest waves in Bosnia Herzegovina. We had plenums. Um, we had major protests in Belgrade in 2016. That was one of the biggest protests held uh, in the in the recent history in Belgrade. It was organized by We Won't Let Belgrade Drown. Uh, we had protests uh, in uh, in Macedonia. We had now this what happened in Montenegro is probably the biggest uh, wave of, of protests we witnessed here in the region. So, but they are very different uh, in their nature. Some of them were triggered by concrete events and some of their, them were led by organizations and we had uh, leaders uh, who were identifiable and then you, you, people uh, knew what their, where their grievances were, they, they clearly articulated them. And some of them were not, some of them were just mere explosions of frustrations. Like in Belgrade this summer, we had in June, uh, major violent crashes, uh, clashes with police uh, in Belgrade. And it really looked as if we're witnessing, uh, as if we're witnessing uh, uh, the beginning of some new processes, but then it just died out. And one of the reasons why it died out probably is because there were no clear demands and uh, these frustrations and grievances were not clearly articulated. And then there was also uh, this, uh, uh, the the, the 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 question of who is organizing this for what i mean you had this triggering event the triggering event was the announcement of the government that they will introduce new isolation measures uh due to covid but they were certainly not this was certainly not the reason why people uh came on the streets and why they protested so loud and violently cl clashed with the police so i think that we had all different uh different elements and uh, very different um different uh, uh protests on the one hand uh we could say that uh this new cycle of protests that is that can be happening uh, globally after 2008 this Pro the wave of new protest movements like Occupy or Indignados, etc. They had some um, influence on the protest movements in the region. We can find echoes of them certainly in this, especially in those protests struggling for the preservation of the commons, urban commons and green commons. But we also have some contextual specificities uh, due to the democratic backsliding in the whole of the region, and uh, well, I think that what's uh, what's I think that what we can learn uh, at least uh, from some of the past events is that a new that the energy and mobilization could come only from better organization. I think that those protest leaders and those movements that. Um, understood that uh, these uh, demands and grievances need to be uh, articulated, that they need to be better articulated and they need to be put under a, a, a clear uh, frame, frame. I think that that's where we can expect uh, some, some success and some long-term uh, results from uh, citizens' mobilizations. Uh, but we still have to see uh, what we still have to see how uh, this process uh, will go on. And I will stop now for the moment and maybe comment on later on. Thank you, thank you, Yelena, and thank you also for mentioning or bringing up this this kind of a transnational, uh, trans-European and global dimension. Basically, the 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 issue or crisis of democracy is something that we face in many parts of, of Europe, and we have seen. Uh, in the recent years, people going to the streets and protesting. So the demand uh, is not only the Western Balkans one, but also uh, the broader one. Uh, I would just like to try again to to, to bring Dobritsa in if he has managed to get uh, on a kind of a better uh, connection. Dobritsa, can you just say one or two words so that we check your... Hi, is better now? That's good. That works out. Yeah. So perfect. So Dobritsa, yeah. take over. This, the same question... Uh, uh, that I posed at the beginning from the perspective of uh, don't let Belgrade drown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I heard a little bit, I restarted the computer. So <laughs> maybe that is, the, uh, that is the cause of the problem, maybe something else. We must work in the, the hard circumstances. Uh, I would just, uh, I would like to, to raise a couple of issues um, regarding the, the, the theme of the, the, the conference and our panel. 
uh, and raise the thanks to organizers again for bringing us together. We need more similar events that bringing people together in the region because that is the, the true force that can be then uh, uh, create something uh, uh, of solidarity and more uh, more more connections that we are liking all. Uh, so what were what was our uh, theory of change and how our movement started um, is that the, the, the change is coming from the bottom up that we must induce politics from the from the themes and topics and issues that are tangible for the ordinary people that uh, that people can feel on their uh, or everyday life uh, in their city life and in their neighborhoods in their blocks and then from that building up the the the, the sentiment of how democracy is not working in our uh, country so i guess some of the what is the successful in our approach is that we started from uh, from the from the everyday life, we looked in our streets, in our neighborhoods, in our kindergartens, in our uh, everyday life, and see what is not working, and then gradually, uh, gradually making these circles of trust and circles of 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 people who are then involved in in fixing those issues, and then by fixing those issues and and, and tackling the, the the issues and understanding what are the processes behind that they're starting to to see that the democracy in serbia and the political system is 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 basically bad and it's not working and that we're not having any um, real rule of law or or uh, division in power and 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 etc so i guess that is the one of the way of how we can uh, tackle the, the issues that are around us and when i was thinking uh, about the issues uh, which I wanted to raise today. Uh, there, are, uh, one is the, the issue with the air pollution, which is uh, our colleagues from the, the, the Northern Macedonia are saying about that that is the invisible issue which is connecting us all in the region. And that is very tangible to people. People can see that there is and feel that there is polluted. And then by explaining and, and working with people on that issue, you can unfold the bigger issues around that, which is how the energy is produced, why the, 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 the Serbian and Bosnian and Macedonian, also Montenegrin energy system is dependent by the coal and which technology and, uh, is behind it and why the energy transition is so so hard because the political elites are so connected to the to the elites uh, the financial and, and, and energy elites in the in the uh, in the region and beyond so that is the issue which we raised and we wanted to to also cooperate and we are cooperating with the, the friends and colleagues from bosnia kosovo macedonia uh, montenegro albania also and by cooperating on that kind of issues, we are we are thinking that we are bringing region more closer and more together because the, the you know like everyday everyday problems are then the same in Belgrade and Pristina and Skopje and and Podgorica and etc. Uh, so that are the one of the, the issues that we are uh, trying to raise, and I think it's it's important to to start from that. Another one which is can be maybe interesting to our um, uh, um, Danish colleagues, and I'm very, uh, very uh, um, sad that we are not together uh, on some better location. But nevertheless, so is is this kind of um, raising uh, raising issue with the surveillance, uh, which is then also connected to the answering your question, Vedran? Uh, is that uh, I know if you are noticed if you are um, so that so in Belgrade there is a huge surge of uh, installing the the Huawei facial recognition cameras through all over the city. So and then there is also as a company to that the citizen uh, citizen mobilization around these issues, and that is all. Then when you put it like that, then you can then unfold the issues around the privacy and data protection and according uh, accordance uh, our legislation framework to the European legislation framework and also connection with the with the with this kind of war on information and who then. Uh, are handling the information to whom and what is the uh, the role of China into that? And I see this 
this huge potential in the in the citizens uh, these days who are wanted to know who is installing the cameras what kind of data is going to be collected who is going to control the data and in which purpose so in that sense there is this kind of blooming civil society movement uh, movements and such in the serbia and also in the region which is connected and we are cooperating to in, uh, to each another but on the other hand there is a huge and, and very harsh response from the government to that in our in our case from 2016 until now so like me personally i have like around 30 uh, 30 court cases for uh, for different actions and activities that we are doing uh, and basically what we are doing we are saying that something is unlawful and something is is contrary to law and that there is uh, there is a, 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 a purpose of the government is to protect the, the public interest is but when we are doing that we got a huge backslash from the legal system that is the one of the pillar of how the the government is reacting to to activists and to 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 to, to critique that is coming from from our side another pillar which is 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 also connected closely to the government is coming from also one source is this kind of media bashing and uh, and the yellow press and the tabloids then who is then working uh side and side with the uh, with the states that is uh, and they wanted to to show you as a foreign uh foreign uh, spy or they are working in some kind of uh, interest of the, the of the um, depends of the, of, of the time of the year. It's, it sometimes is European Union, sometimes is the uh, USA, sometimes is Soros. You never know uh, who you're working on for. And another one is this kind of also notion of the police presence everywhere and the security system apparatus, which is constantly monitoring on your activities and 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 and, and what are you doing uh, on. On on uh, on our side, there is a huge amount of 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 hope and also a huge amount of of energy that we want to fix the, the broken system and the broken democracy in Serbia. And also, we are very keen to work uh, work with the with, with the others uh, actors in the region because it's kind of domino effect. We saw uh, the the recent changes in Montenegro, some of those. In in in, uh, poli in political sense in in Bosnia, so that is the way of which is which is yeah the, the political elites are communicating and learning from each other. So I hope that we must more, more, must must learn more from each other uh, from each other in the future. So not to be too 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 long. Yeah, we are done. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dobitz, and thank you particularly for, I mean, obviously for hope and energy. Uh, that's important, that's fundamental, optimism, and you have it, your eyes are shining. <laughs> that's good, uh, but also uh, uh, for the theory of change. So you basically described it. So common uh, bottom-up uh, problems, mobilization, making it, making it tangible, uh, palpable for ordinary people and building up alliances. Uh, against the unlawful uh, as the next step. Uh, this is the, the the way that you go. Uh, you mentioned Montenegro and we uh, we go to Luka uh, Rakčević. Luka, are you sitting in Podgorica or somewhere else? Yeah, I'm in Podgorica. Unfortunately, not on the seaside, so that will yeah. be <laughs> to see the sea at least in times of lockdown. Uh, Luka, uh, uh, your movement, political party, I mean, you went a long way of fighting uh, the regime of, of Milo Djukanovic uh, throughout the elections. And now you are in a position, uh, or you were in the position to be the kingmaker uh, of, the, of, of the new government. Can you uh, uh, briefly just go back and reflect on, on your foundations uh, and, and your fights, and then uh, tell us and our Danish colleagues uh, what has changed and what are you doing right now as part of the government? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Vedran, and, and thank, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a real, real pleasure to be here and to speak with all of you. Uh, yes, you said it correctly. We uh, uh, were founded as a political movement of free citizens trying to achieve the simple political change in Montenegro. And uh, the 
whole political situation in Montenegro is, was and still is a bit specific because uh, until the 30th of August this year, we never have changed our government in a free and democratic elections. And when I say never, I really mean it, never in, in a whole and very long history of Montenegro. So this year we fin finally managed to do that, to, 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 to achieve that simple political change on, on the elections and to start the process of transition, which will, I am sure, uh, result in, in a very uh, good and, and, and better political society and, and, and political spectrum. So uh, for the three decades, we had the uh, one party and one leader in power. That leader is currently also uh, acting as a president of Montenegro, uh, but uh, the great majority in parliament of Montenegro uh, is changed, and uh, I think that we now have some uh, clear path to, 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 to uh, make the uh, corrections that we need. Uh, during that three decades, which is a very long period, uh, the ruling party managed, unfortunately, to capture uh, and politicize all, uh, politicize all institutions and to make them politically dependent. Uh, they also managed to uh, control the uh, voting process and, and, and to do uh, vote buying, which is a very, very strange thing for, for 2020 and for, for democracy. Uh, they also uh, managed to capture all media and to, 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 to uh, bring in the, the censorship, uh, especially in terms of state media, and to, to make that uh, the most important part, to make that um, you know, these divisions uh, mostly bordered on uh, ethno and religious lines, which helped them to, 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 to remain in power for that long period of time. So right now we uh, won these elections despite uh, their, their uh, involvement in, in, in uh, vote buying and, and, and uh, trying to, 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 to capture one more voting process in Montenegro. So we won that. And now we are trying to make this transition uh, good. Uh, right now we are forming the uh, expert government, which is also uh, a kind of experiment here in Montenegro. We never had anything like that. So right now, in, in about 12 or 13 days, we will elect uh, a government of experts, uh, which will include uh, a lot of people from uh, university, a lot of people from uh, business area, and a lot of people who were never involved in politics directly, uh, nor uh, uh, through uh, opposition parties, nor through DPS, which were which, which, which were the ruling party for a long time. So uh, right now we are uh, expecting the government proposal from the uh, future prime minister. And I'm sure that uh, uh, in December we will start strongly to, 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 to make the changes that we need. We are facing, unfortunately, the, the great crisis, uh, uh, mostly uh, the crisis of healthcare system and the, the, the crisis uh, induced by COVID-19. We are the country with the uh, most uh, per capita cases in whole Europe, so it's it's a really difficult for us right now. Also, we have the great economical problems uh, because, uh, for example, 100% uh, of our GDP is a public debt, and uh, we have a lot of things that we must change and then a lot of things that we must uh, pull forward so we can make Montenegro a normal country and, and uh, so we can empower democratic mechanisms. But I really think that these uh, changes that happened in, in, in August this year are really, really important uh, in terms of uh, citizen empowerment and in terms of uh, de developing the democracy and building independent institutions because uh, it was the first time in our whole history that citizens really felt the, uh, the power of their vote. Of, of their voting process. So I think it's really, really important for Montenegro to, to, to introduce them that mechanism so they can punish every political elite, which is uh, not doing uh, good for, the, for our uh, country and for our people. Uh, they did it with the DPS. Tomorrow, if we uh, do not uh, do the, the, the good job, they should punish us also and continue the, the process along. So I think that we started that wheel, that we started that wave, and I think it's, it's, it's great for Montenegro and the whole region. And I'm really also hoping that that wave can reach the shores of other uh, Balkan uh, countries, because uh, for a long time we had uh, a number of stabilocracies 
which ruled the, the Balkan countries in a way they shouldn't. And I really think that uh, this will be a start of a greater change for whole uh, Western Balkans and, 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 and uh, this part of Europe. So we can really uh, go with the better way. And then so we can really uh, uh, get closer to the European Union and, and, and that integration. So I think that we have, uh, we have done a good thing, that we are on a good path, but it's all also depending on us right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luca. I mean, the Montenegrinian uh, case is paradigmatic. I mean, uh, we all, a year before, assumed that uh, Djukanovic will uh, go on for the next 50 years, at least, yeah. until he is alive. Uh, and now your example basically shows uh, that change is possible. So change is possible when you organize yourself, when you uh, uh, manage to mobilize the civic civic voices and forces. And uh, just recently, uh, uh, in Bosnia, uh, we had local elections, and there were also like small changes, not very big ones, uh, not that the ethno politics was totally removed, but in some parts of Bosnia, we, we basically saw new, uh, new forces coming up, uh, which might also go into this kind of an optimistic direction. Uh, let me now, uh, I mean, just when, as, as Dobritsa was speaking and mentioning Soros, uh, uh, basically, I realized that you are, and we are a Soros panel, almost, even though probably the majority of you have never, has never received uh, a Soros, a Soros money, but basically this is uh, all, uh, I mean, there is this trend and narrative that activists, uh, whether they get some Soros money or not get some Soros money, are usually blazed, blamed uh, or labeled as, as Soros army. Uh, so this is a Soros army panel, but that brings me to a serious question. Uh, and, and, and the question is, when we say that there is a, a, a theory of change, there, is a, there are civic voices, there is a popular demand for democracy, there are overarching common structural problems like air pollution, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what is basically what the European Union and the international community uh, is supposed to do and should do in order to support uh, your fight to create new alliances beyond uh, formal alliances that they have uh, with some uh, of, of political structures in the region. So I would just, before we go to, there is also a question in the Q&A in the chat, but before we uh, go to this one, I would just love to have, to hear you on that one. What uh, could the EU and should the EU do better uh, 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 in, in the years to come? Just few sentences from from each of you and let's uh, start again uh, in uh, uh, North Macedonia Arianit. well uh, Vedran, um, it was it was really nice uh, hearing all the inputs from other participants uh, and um, <clears throat> obviously we we pretty much share the same problems um, and to answer your question I think that um, there a reform on the accession uh, um, program is, is pretty much necessary for the European Union. And uh, currently, uh, as you are all aware, North Macedonia is called North Macedonia because of the name dispute uh, uh, with Greece that has lasted for so many years. Um, now we have the problem with uh, Bulgaria, which is uh, posing some uh, new obstacles on our uh, path to the European Union. And I think uh, this type of practice should stop because uh, the process will be a never ending one. Uh, and I believe that the European Union should pose uh, more, um, let's say, demands, strict demands, and uh, very practical issues rather than uh, neighboring uh, countries posing uh, issues to, to their neighbors for whatever reasons. Uh, the whole Balkan region has uh, opened, uh, open issues uh, let's not forget the issue with uh, Serbia and Kosovo, um, North Macedonia and Bulgaria. Uh, we also had the issues with Croatia and Slovenia. I'm pretty sure Croatia might have issues with Bosnia, Bosnia with Montenegro and so on and so forth. And this, uh, this uh, vicious circle is going on and on and uh, people are losing hope. So I believe uh, um, what, is, what is needed to be done in the... Uh, in Brussels, you know, they should, uh, in the European Union, they should come up with uh, very um, strict guidelines and, uh, and demands that um, candidate countries should um, uh, fulfill uh, in order to become a member of the, uh, of the European Union. 
and then uh, leave these uh, other issues, neighboring issues, to be uh, resolved once uh, the countries have become member states. Um, it, it is exhausting, especially for, um, for people like us, for activists, because we fight very hard to see change happen. And then uh, something which is uh, beyond uh, our, let's say, not only our control, but beyond, uh, beyond any imaginable uh, um, situation, you know, uh, they will just block you because they don't like something that, that your country has or your country does. Um, that's something that I need. Uh, I think uh, I think the European Union should look into uh, in order to uh, not just make it easier. We don't want an easy uh, access path. We want um, a possible access path. As if now uh, we we don't know what's coming next. Uh, let's let's hope that North Macedonia and Bulgaria will resolve this issue. But we don't know what what can happen next. Maybe maybe Greece comes up with something new. Maybe Bulgaria again comes up with something new. Uh, maybe Albania joins uh, EU before North Macedonia, and then Albania comes up with some 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 new demands. So I think uh, this kind of uh, games played by by the neighbors uh, should stop. And I think the European Union should make sure that uh, this kind of of practice uh, stops once and for all. Um, if I may, uh, Vedran, I would love to just uh, add on some more comments on, on uh, some of the questions that were raised uh, by, by other speakers. Oh, yeah, uh, just just keep, it, keep it short so that we, uh, we have to end uh, sharp. Of, of course, of course, uh, especially uh, with the example of Ura in, uh, in Montenegro. And uh, uh, they, they set a very good example of civil activism becoming uh, uh, a key player, you know, um, in, in political involvement. But um, in our country, you know, anytime that the politics have flirted with the civil activists, it has been the activists that have been screwed. Um, so, um, and the popular perception is that uh, if, if activists uh, are to be involved in politics, you know, uh, they lose the credibility and, and that's uh, when we lose the agenda and we lose our mission. So uh, we're trying to uh, overpass all these, overcome all these obstacles, all these pressure, uh, threats, intimidation, bribe attempts, uh, bribe attempts, uh, blackmailing, and so on and so forth, by uh, staying true to the mission. Um, I, I, I really believe and I really hope that uh, the uh, not only URA but uh, the expert uh, expert uh, government in Montenegro will be a very good example to be followed in the other countries. Uh, we have a new government in the country, but we're not happy. To be honest, we're not happy. We, we are happy we don't have Gruevsky, but we still have the Gruevism uh, going on because it's the same practices pretty much. And um, with that being said, um, again, you know, uh, we really hope that uh, activists will stay true to their mission and fight harder for, for what they believe. And, uh, and the politics will just, uh, just help in achieving those uh, uh, common goods and common uh, uh, goals for the for the common good of their people. Thanks, Ayanit. Uh, Yelena, uh, the same question to you. Uh, uh, I asked you for a brief brief uh, response. Uh, what's uh, what we do need from the European Union, and what is what we don't need mm. in terms of uh, civic activism? Yes, I, I don't think that that EU needs to support uh, civil society in the region in terms of giving open support to civic initiatives and what would be more helpful is to stop giving support to autocratic tendencies um, because they are seen as an acceptable trade-off for the promised stability because we all have a sense that there's a hidden agenda to, uh, to that there's the, the, the articulated demands and expectations from the part of the EU and then there's a hidden mm -hmm. agenda of we actually want for instance, in the case of Serbia, we actually want to, to seal the deal with Kosovo and uh, we'll turn a blind eye uh, for, if, for, you know, for all the other, uh, for the democratic backsliding, if it's, in the, if it's going in the direction of, of doing what is promised. So I think that we need the EU to be more straightforward in condemning uh, the, everything that is going wrong in the region, to be more, more demanding in, in delivering uh, delivering what is needed for uh, the chapters to be open and we I think that that, that kind of support is is what we need 
yeah let's keep uh, fingers crossed i mean that's probably not the best week to speak about this one having in mind uh the 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 crash uh and the clash in between poland hungary and the european exactly. right now ongoing but let's see uh Dobritza, what's your take uh and and particularly have you have you experienced any kind of a direct support for your movement uh, coming from from the european union does it help and what doesn't help uh, what we faced is that there is a surge of, 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 of solidarity between movements and also on European level. So from green movements, so different municipal movements through, through all of the, 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 the citizen, uh, citizen groups and, and organizations that are um, dealing with the same issues like uh, like I mentioned, the air pollution, the, the urban development, the, the different approach to, to to local democracy. So there is a kind of connections. But what what we need is this more like institutional level of of, of bringing people, play people together, and to talk and to exchange and to more like more more travel, more more visiting, more more all of those things that are bringing people closer and then by doing just that you will you will have some 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 new ideas and new energy and new 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 uh, uh, new initiatives but as as Ayelena mentioned I, I especially in the recent developments regarding the elections and the boycott of elections I don't know how much people are know that but in the in the previous time we had like huge boycott of the the parliamentary and the local elections Elections because there is there isn't any satisfactory um, uh, circumstances and there is a huge media blockage and there is a kind of autocracy happening in Serbia. So what we need basically need is not from our European partners is, is not to turning out a blind eye on, on what is happening and a little bit more be uh, interested in, 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 in this kind of uh, another version of the, of the, what is happening. I know that is a hide. It's usually hard to find what is, you know, like real, real, uh, real story and real things. But we are here to help in that. And there is no so 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 hard to to reach out to to those that are on the ground constantly and have like inputs how things are really happening. So in that sense, I will. I will, my suggestion is more talks, more consultations, more digging up the the real, yeah, the real issues which are, uh, yeah, which are, which are, yeah, people face every day. You know? Another side of the truth, and put the focus on it. Uh, so, Luca, your take on the same question. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, as you mentioned, and Dylan also, uh, we all understand that European Union has have its own problems, especially in Poland and in Hungary and some other countries and uh, uh, their problems with the rising right wing politics in European Parliament and everything. So we can all understand that they are occupied by their own problems, but also we couldn't understand earlier and we, we cannot understand it uh, right now that uh, they have the um, different approaches uh, with the same things. For example, you cannot uh, uh, tell or say that uh, Viktor Orban is an uh, autocracy leader and that Djukanovic or uh, some other leaders in the Balkans are democratic leader. We had that uh, experience that the great majority of the stabilocracy leaders uh, had that uh, pro-Western uh, facade or disguise and pro-democratic disguise and that uh, helped a lot uh, to the EU the, uh, and their institutions to uh, make uh, some uh, 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 angle to support them without telling anyone that they are not democratic, really. Uh, so we uh, tried to uh, find another way. So we uh, made a great um, uh, connection with the European Greens, which are, which are uh, right now one of the largest uh, groups in the European Parliament and they really helped us a lot uh, during this uh, struggle. Uh, they gave us uh, a lot of support, uh, concrete and, 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 and a direct support. Uh, they came to Montenegro several times, they, they uh, connected us with uh, some people in the EU. So I think that there are ways to, 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 to uh, exploit the, the, the situation in European Union 
uh, in, in towards towards the, the democratization of, of Balkan states. Uh, we must call a spade a spade. You know, if if uh, some regime is not democratic, you cannot call it democratic. If you are really fighting for a true democratic values, so I think that European Union must uh, must take a frank stand in that point, uh, and 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 just to uh, tell people what's what's real situation there. Thank you so much, uh, Luca. Uh, I, I was looking now in the Q and A. There is a specific question on the unequal uh, development and unequal exchange. I will uh, post by Vanya Tsakic. Uh, as the time is a bit running out, I would suggest uh, Vanya, if possible, to to forward a, a message to me or to the organizer, and we can then. Uh, uh, forward it to Arianit, uh, who might be able to answer that one. But uh, as we have three minutes, uh, just one last very, very quick uh, one sentence uh, question and one sentence answer. So usually in, 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 in the debates, we have this dilemma, whether as when we have activism and bottom up movements, whether to enter the political arena, form a political party and fight from within or to stay outside and to be active bottom up. Uh, so what will be your take uh, just to conclude the round? Move, transform into a political party or stay outside of the, uh, of the formal politics or both? Uh, try to keep both alive. Just one sentence, Aryanit, uh, you are the first. Well, I think I already gave that answer, but shortly uh, there are still other opportunities to do this. So we can lobby, we can uh, pressure the politics, we can petition them, we can negotiate with them, we can, uh, there's a lot of tools, uh, advocacy tools that we can utilize to, to make things happen. So we don't have to become a political party to achieve our goals. Uh, it has, we, we have seen that happen. Yeah, Dobitz, uh, uh, the same question to you, uh, and also particularly having in mind uh, the situation in Croatia, where a similar movement like yeah, yours, basically Mojemo, uh, uh, transformed into a political party and now entered the Croatian parliament. So what's your take on this one? Uh, my take is that uh, we tried to, to, to fix the system through doing it uh, uh, outside of the system, like NGOs, the civil society, etc. It didn't fa it had failed, failed miserably because there is no dialogue and because of time we cannot de detail that. So we tried, we, we are now trying to do it inside, like to transform it through the political movement, but also to have, to never forget and to have this this check and checks and balances uh, inside of the civil society to have like both both tracks one is institutions and another one is, uh, is 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 outside of it to have it is both 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 uh, things and yeah then the answer is both <laughs> thank you thank you so much dobitsa galena a quick take from your side uh, from the perspective of the society, we need both and we need all kinds of pressures and activities. And from the perspective of concrete social movement or initiative, it really depends on the nature of your initiative and really depends on your goals. Yeah, so. But in any case, we need and movements need uh, organizational forms. So, Luca, I mean, uh, I believe your answer is quite obvious, uh, but do you smell the, the, the danger uh, that something similar like in North Macedonia with uh, a call for revolution could happen? So that you uh, just by entering the politics and government uh, partly uh, damage the civil society and civic movements? Yeah, it's, it's a great challenge, but I am really, uh, I really hope that we can uh, go through it and, and in, a, in a good way. Uh, it's also a difficult question. I agree with Yelena here. Uh, you can do it from within and you can do it from, from outside, but it's also specific for uh, countries which have uh, autocracies because it's, it's very hard for you to be the, the, the corrective mechanism if the government don't want to correct anything. So it's, it's very hard to do it from, from, uh, from outside, from, 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 from uh, behind. So. I think that in one point in every country, uh, people must politically engage, directly politically engage to, 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 to make these changes possible. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Luca. Uh, as you have seen, uh, I mean, that was a fighter panel, uh, activists, fighters, people that do share hope, energy, uh, that uh, want to uh, 
change and to give the voice to the popular demands uh, from the citizens. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Dobrica, Jelena, to Belgrade, Luca, to Podgorica, Montenegro, Arjanit, to uh, North Macedonia. Uh, thank you for uh, listening and I give uh, back uh, to the organizer to uh, start the, uh, the, and to announce the next panel. Thank you so much.